Pokemon. Everyone's favorite game of pure skill. Sure, there is some RNG here and there, but by and large, anything bad that happens is the result of your own mis- Ah, crap. Okay, okay, so there might be some RNG here and there, but with the proper planning, you can be ready to adapt. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? Are you- Okay, right, fine, that's fine. Sometimes you can just get dunked on and it's not your fault, but most of the time, son of a bitch! Luck. Love it or hate it, it's an undeniable part of Pokemon, of video games, and of life as a whole. It's the one unavoidable truth of our existence. Sometimes things go well, sometimes things go bad, and a lot of the time there's literally no rhyme or reason to it. We all know that you can get pretty unlucky in Pokemon, but have you ever wondered how lucky you could get? If your focus blast never missed, if your opponent never crit you to death, if you could walk through rock tunnel with nary a Zubat in sight. Is it even wise to start down this path? To learn of a treasure that we will never be able to possess? The answer is clear. No. That would be a very bad idea. So join me as I do an obscene amount of math, go insane counting tiles, and even simulate an entire game of Fire Red in a spreadsheet to be able to answer the question. What is the luckiest possible game of Pokemon? Richard, hit that intro. In order to find the single luckiest game of Pokemon possible, we first need to define what we mean by luck. Because technically speaking, there is no upper bound on how lucky you can get in a game like Pokemon. Sure, the game where you find 45 billion shiny Pokemon is pretty lucky. But what about the one where you find 45 billion and one? So for the sake of today's video, we'll be looking at luck as it pertains to a Pokemon Fire Red speedrun. And we'll define luck as anything that happens as a result of random chance that helps us beat the game faster than we otherwise would have. So, in order to find the luckiest possible speedrun of Pokemon Fire Red, all I need to do is go through every instance of RNG in the whole entire game and find the odds of something happening that will help you beat the game even a single frame faster. And I have very wisely given myself exactly one week to research, write, record, and edit this whole video. Seems totally doable to me. Stupid. Before we get too deep into the video, I want to take a second to shamelessly shill my Patreon. Real talk, these videos take a lot of time and effort to make. This one is spent, look at the time, look at the time of this one. That's too much. And they genuinely would not be possible without the support of viewers like you. So if you want to support the channel and help me make more videos like this in the future, and most importantly, if you can comfortably afford it, then there's a link in the top of the description that will take you to my Patreon page. There's a couple of tiers that get you access to all sorts of perks like early access, exclusive live streams, and getting to suggest and vote on future video topics for the channel. If you're not able to directly support the channel at this moment, absolutely no worries, I totally get it. Just subscribing and sharing the video with a friend helps out a ton too. All right, enough of that crap, let's get back to some math. So, here we go. We start the game and almost immediately come upon the first instance of RNG, your starter Pokemon. And already, there's a lot of random stuff that could go right or wrong. I'm sure the first thing that a lot of people think of when they hear the words luck and Pokemon is shinies. In generation three, any Pokemon has a one in 8,192 chance of being shiny, meaning that it has an alternate color palette and your starter is no exception. However, in the case of a speed run, technically speaking, 
it's better to not get a shiny Pokemon because of the little sparkle animation that plays every time you send out. What? What? It's true. No, look, you send it out, it sparkles, it costs you a little bit of time every single day. Come on, look, guys, the speedrunners are gonna eat me alive if I include that. You know what? Oh, fine, fine, fine. You win. We'll make it shiny. You know what? Fine, fine. We'll do it both ways. I'll calculate the luckiest possible run with a shiny Pokemon and without a shiny Pokemon. Happy? <laughs> now, believe it or not, there's more to a starter Pokemon than its color palette. For anyone who's not intimately familiar with the Pokemon statistics generation formula, I'd like to apologize for the migraine in advance. Speedrunners have already determined that Squirtle is the most optimal starter choice for this game. But not all Squirtles are created equally. Speedrunners generally look for two things in a good starter Pokemon. Those being high IVs and a beneficial nature. IVs are a random number ranging from 0 to 31 for each of a Pokemon's six stats that influences how strong each of those stats will become. So, as an example, a Squirtle with zero IVs in HP is gonna have a lot less health than one with 31 IVs in HP, and the difference only becomes more pronounced as you level up. In the luckiest possible scenario, you'll get a Squirtle with 31 IVs in attack, special attack, and speed. The other three stats don't really matter as much because they all deal with health and defenses, and in this run, I don't plan on ever getting hit. Now, the more analytical among you may question this already, because yes, having a higher IV results in a higher base stat, but does that actually matter? Remember, we defined luck as anything that helps us beat the game faster, and realistically, having one less point in speed won't change anything for the long run. If we want to be truly accurate here, we should go through and calculate the lowest possible IVs that we can afford to get in each stat and still be able to beat the game as quickly as possible. And to that I say, I already did that. We'll get into all the math of the battles later, but it turns out that if you have even one IV less than perfect in any of these three stats, there is at least one instance where you won't be able to one-shot something that you could have with a crit otherwise, or one Pokemon that you can no longer outspeed and you have to watch their whole turn. If you want to beat this game as quickly as is theoretically possible, then you need to have perfect IVs in these three stats. But how rare is this? Well, IVs range from 0 to 31, so the odds of having a perfect IV in any given stat is 1 in 32, since 0 is also an option. To find the odds of getting perfect IVs in the three stats that we care about, we can multiply 1 in 32 by itself three times, or more simply, raise it to the third power. But we're not quite done yet. The other random factor that comes into play with your starter Pokemon is your nature. A Pokemon's nature provides a 1.1 times boost to one of its stats, excluding HP, and a 0.9 times nerf to another. Generally speaking, speedrunners prefer a nature that boosts special attack because you can more reliably KO a few Pokemon in the game. However, if you bank on always getting critical hits in these clutch moments, then technically speaking, a positive speed nature is more preferable as it will let you outspeed certain foes and take them out before they have a chance to go, since there's no critting on speed or anything. We don't want a nature that decreases either of our attacking stats, it will ruin the perfect IVs we work so hard for, but a drop in defense or special defense is totally fine. So that means that of the 25 possible natures, a hasty or naive Squirtle 
will be the best. That means that we need to multiply the 1 in 32 to the third from before by 2 in 25 to find the odds of randomly getting a perfect Squirtle. Doing all the math, we find that the odds of you randomly getting a perfect Squirtle for a speed run is 1 in 409,650 for a normal Squirtle, or 1 in 3 billion 355,443,200 for a shiny. And that is the very first thing you do in the game. Got a long way to go. After choosing your starter, you jump right into your first battle with your rival, but we're actually gonna skip over that for now and talk about all the battles together later, because it gets really, really complicated. So instead, we'll do the easier thing and go touch grass. One of the hallmarks of this era of Pokemon is random encounters. Every time you enter a grass patch, cave tile, or water tile, you have a chance of encountering a wild Pokemon, which takes up some time. In a normal speedrun, they'll typically KO a few random Pokemon that they run into on Route 1 to get some early levels, then once they hit Pewter, they'll buy repels and never encounter a wild Pokemon again. But here's the thing, going to the Pokemart to buy repels takes time. Not a lot of time, and you will almost definitely save way more time in the long run, but the operative word there is almost. There is technically a non-zero chance that you could run through the entire game with no repels and still never run into a single Pokemon. But how do we find the odds of this happening? Well, it's quite simple actually. All I have to do is find the shortest possible path through the game and painstakingly count up every single grass cave and water tile that you have to walk through. Wait, what? Using the current world record speedrun as a guide, I was able to tally up every single tile that you walk through that has a chance to spawn a random encounter for each and every route and area in the game. Now, was this fun? No. That's it, that, that's the end of the sentence. But getting this list is only half the battle because we still need to know the odds of encountering a Pokemon on each step. It turns out this can be easily determined by this formula. R is the base encounter rate for an area. This is 20 for all standard routes, 10 for caves and dungeons, four for water routes, and 25 for the safari zone. Plugging that into this formula, you will get the odds of encountering a Pokemon on any given step. So, to find the odds of not encountering a Pokemon, we can simply subtract that from 1. Then, we just need to raise that whole thing to the power of the number of tiles you have to walk through per route. If we do that for every single route and dungeon in the game, we'll have the odds of never getting an encounter without having to buy a single repel. Oh, 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 if only it were that easy. Because it turns out, never getting a single encounter throughout the whole game would be really bad. This is generation three, which means that we're squarely in the age of HMs. There are four HMs that are required to complete this game, those being Cut, Fly, Surf, and Strength. Blastoise can learn the latter two, but for Cut and Fly, you have to catch someone else to help out. Typically, speedrunners will use a Pidgey for Fly and a Rattata for Cut. They are both super common on Route 1. You'll probably run into a few of them before you buy repels anyway. However, there is technically a better, but far less reliable option. Not for Fly, Pidgey is still the best for that. I mean, they're literally, you cannot escape. Oh my God, too many Pidgeys. But the problem with Rattata as your cut Pokemon is that this is the only HM it can learn. This means that you'll have to end up teaching strength 
to your starter later in the game, which is fine, it's an okay move, but as you'll see much later, there are better options. Of the Pokemon available before Vermilion, which is when you need Cut by, Nidoran is the only one that can learn both Cut and Strength. If you manage to catch one of those, you'll be able to dump both Cut and Strength on there and save a slot for your starter later in the game. Now that sounds, well I'll be honest, that sounds pretty great. Why don't all speedrunners do this? Could it have something to do with the fact that there is a three tile window where you can encounter one of these without incurring some sort of time loss? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Oh, you can no, actually, it doesn't make sense. Hey everyone, Future Charlie here. I did such a terrible job explaining this next part that I literally couldn't salvage it without having an editor's note that looked like this. First of all, I said there were three required grass tiles on Route 3. That is not true. You can sail through this whole route without stepping on a single grass tile. In fact, you actually have to go slightly out of your way to hit one. The grass in this route is only required if you want a Nidoran, which we do. You can also technically get a Nidoran on Route 5 or a Sand Shrew on Route 4 if you're playing Leaf Green version, but they both require going even further out of your way than to get this Nidoran. I timed it out, this is your best possible option. When initially writing this video, I assumed that you would use a path like this, moving through three grass tiles, but that's actually pretty dumb. You could totally choose to walk through five grass patches, one grass patch, or anything in between without adding any extra steps. Running through a bunch of math that I'll get into later, it turns out that you have the best chance of getting a Pokemon that you need and not any other unnecessary encounters by walking through precisely two grass tiles, and the lowest chance if you walk through all five. Now, you could make the argument that if all routes are equal in terms of time, then the luckiest option would be if you took the worst path and still got the Nidoran and nothing else. But the general rule that I've been using is that you have to actively try to maximize your odds if you can, so long as it doesn't cost you extra time. If you're always going out of your way to make bad choices just to get more lucky, then you run into the same no upper bounds issue that I talked about in the beginning. So basically, I said you have to walk through three grass tiles on Route 3 to get a Nidoran. That's not true. You don't have to walk through any, but you should walk through exactly two. Alright, now back to the idiot. All that is to say, instead of finding the odds of never getting an encounter throughout the whole game, we need to find the odds of getting exactly two encounters, those encounters being a Pidgey and a Nidoran, and those encounters occurring before their associated HM gate. And that, well that's a little more complicated. To understand the sort of math required to figure this out, let's look at a far simpler example. Say you're rolling two dice, and you want to find the odds of getting exactly one six. Well, if we lay out all the possible combinations that you could roll, we see that of the 26 pairs, 10 of them have exactly one six. That means that you have a 10 in 36 chance of getting one six when you roll two dice. And when we look at the math, this makes sense. Instead of rolling the dice together, let's roll them one at a time. The first dice has a one in six chance of being a six. If it is, then the second die can be anything but a six, so a five in six chance. Or conversely, if the first die is not a six, again, a five in six chance, then the second one has to be a six. Because we don't care which die is a six, either of these solutions will get us the outcome we're looking for. So we can simply add these odds together. 
However, you may notice that these two odds are actually the same odds. So we can simplify this to 1 sixth times 5 sixth times 2, the number of dice that we're rolling. And if you do the math, you'll see that this comes out to exactly 10 36 exactly what we expected. We can use this same logic for the Pokemon if we simply plug in the formulas from earlier for encountering and not encountering something on a given tile, and multiplying that by the number of tiles you walk through per route. The Nidoran can only be encountered on Route 3, so finding the odds are pretty easy. However, the Pidgey could show up in the grass on Route 1, Route 3, or Route 6, so it's easiest to calculate these three different scenarios independently than add the probabilities together in the end. If you find the Pidgey on Route 1, then you need to get exactly one encounter on Route 1 out of 52 possible encounter chances, and the other 51 we get no encounters. Since we don't care when that one encounter occurs in the route, we can use the same logic from the dice example to find the odds of that happening like this. Each encounter you get on Route 1 has a 50% chance of being a Pidgey, so we can multiply this whole thing by 0.5. And then, of course, you have to actually catch the thing. You have a 1 in 3 chance to capture a Pidgey in a Pokeball if it's at full health, which would be the fastest way to do it. Using the same formula, we can find the odds of getting exactly one Nidoran on Route 3 and catching it, and nothing on Route 6. And then we can use that same process for if we find nothing on Route 1 and a Pidgey on Route 6, or if we find both a Nidoran and a Pidgey or a Spearow on Route 3, and then, obviously, we want to repeat this process for if you want all your Pokemon to be shiny or if you want to win. So, put simply, to find the odds of getting exactly one Nidoran and one Flyer before we need them, we can use this very basic equation. Just super, super basic. That accounts for all the routes before Vermilion, since there's no mandatory grass patches between here and Celadon where you can get Fly. So for any route after that, we can use the first formula to find the odds of never getting encounters, and all that together is the odds of getting only two Pokemon that you need to fully traverse the game, and nothing else. And remember, we skipped over the battles in favor of doing this first, because this was easier. Battles are tricky because there's a lot of RNG at play, and there are a lot of battles. In a speedrun, there are 195 individual Pokemon that you have to battle, and for every single one, you have to find out which move has the best chance of killing, whether or not you need a crit, whether or not they'll outspeed you, whether or not their attack will miss, secondary effects, status conditions, all to find the fastest possible way to win each battle and the odds of that happening. So, you know, all pretty simple stuff. Obviously, this is a lot to keep track of, and if I did this all manually, then this video would literally never get done. But luckily, there is an easier way. All we need to do is completely simulate an entire game of Pokemon Fire Red within the confines of a spreadsheet. Any statistics and data analyst nerds out there, hold on to your pants. To start, speedrun.com has a pre-made spreadsheet with every single trainer in the game, their Pokemon, and those Pokemon's in-game stats. So I simply pulled out only the trainers that you have to fight as a part of this speedrun and made that the basis for my new spreadsheet. I added in some more information like their types and EV yields, which will be important later. I call this section the baddies. If you look to your right, you'll see section number two of the spreadsheet entitled 
It's your boy Squirtle here with all the information about my base stats that you could possibly hope for that seems a little too excessive, but is actually super important. A very aptly named section because it has all the information about your boy Squirtle that you could possibly hope for, which is all very critical to the workings of the rest of the sheet, and if I messed it up at all, it would literally ruin everything. Which I definitely did like four times. See, spreadsheets can do this cool thing where you can input specific formulas to have the spreadsheet do a bunch of math for you. So, as an example, this first column here will use this simple formula to keep track of the amount of experience you've accumulated by simply adding the XP gained from section 1 to the amount of XP that you just had. So, I can simply copy over all the XP yields for every Pokemon that you have to battle, and this column will automatically update. Then, the column next to it will use the total accumulated EXP to calculate what level your Squirtle will be at at any given time, using this equally simple formula. What the hell is that? Then we have our starter's base stats, making sure to increase them as our starter evolves at the appropriate levels. And after that, we have a section that will automatically keep track of all the EVs that our starter has accumulated throughout the game. Because those are another thing that most Pokemon players outside of the competitive scene barely think about, but are super important to how your Pokemon grows as it levels. Did you know that your starter will gain 71 speed IVs across a whole speed run? Because I do now! And then lastly, we can plug all that information into the stat formula that Pokemon uses to calculate every single in-game stat for our starter Pokemon for every single battle in the game, making sure to only apply stat boost gain from EVs when you level up, not in between. And with that, we now know all the stats of our Pokemon and our opponent for every single battle in the game, and we have yet to simulate a single one of them. In order to simulate a Pokemon battle in a spreadsheet, we first need to check who goes first by comparing our starter's speed stat to the speed stat of the Pokemon that it's facing. Then we need to calculate how much damage our Pokemon can do. The Pokemon damage formula for Generation 3 looks like this, but most of this stuff like weather and stockpile don't ever come into play, so we can simplify this equation down to this. This first section with all the parentheses is where we input all the stats information that we just calculated, along with the base power of the move in question. Any attack has a 1 in 16 chance of being a critical hit, which in Generation 3 deals two times as much damage. A move also deals 1.5 times more damage if its type matches the type of the Pokemon using it. We also need to account for the resistances and weaknesses of any given move by looking at the two types of the opponent we're attacking and applying the proper multiplier, and then lastly, accounting for the random roll that each move does when dealing damage. Whenever you attack, the game will generate a random number between 1 and 16 and convert that into a multiplier. So you have a 1 in 16 chance of getting a high roll and dealing full damage, but you also have a 1 in 16 chance of getting a low roll and dealing 0.85 times as much damage. Ooh. Now I could just assume that you're getting as lucky as possible and always getting a high roll and a critical hit. But remember, all the way back at the very start, we defined luck as anything that happens that helps you beat the game faster. Sure, getting a critical hit every single turn is unlikely, but if a Pokemon was very low on health anyway, then getting a critical hit doesn't actually help you, and in fact, you actually have to sit through an extra text box, which costs you just a tiny bit of time. So it's really better to only get a critical hit when you absolutely need it. Because of that, I can't just simply calculate one damage value for each attack, I needed to find four 
one for a low roll, one for a high roll, one for a low roll crit, and one for a high roll crit. Then I subtracted that from the total HP that the defending Pokemon has, and if that value is less than or equal to zero, that means that you can KO that Pokemon in a single blow. If a regular attack is enough to KO a Pokemon without the need for a crit, then I didn't bother calculating the rest. That way, we know the most likely way that you can KO a Pokemon. Then, using the accuracy of each move and whether or not it needs to be a crit, I was able to calculate the odds of KOing a Pokemon with a single attack. In cases where it comes down to a random roll, instead of trying to program in some functionality where the spreadsheet will automatically calculate the roll required, that seemed like a lot of effort for a few edge cases. I just made a yell at me and go, hey, hey, hey idiot, go check this one yourself, dummy. But I couldn't just do that for tackle. I had to do that for every single move that our starter can and will use throughout the game, making sure that they only come into play at the appropriate level. Then I could find which move has the best odds to one hit KO and automatically pull that value over to this final column. After that whole process is done, we find that the vast majority of battles can be won in a single hit, if you're lucky. However, there are some edge cases that we need to look into. For starters, any time that we're not able to outspeed, our opponent gets an opportunity to attack. For these cases, I needed to look into the moveset of that Pokemon and consult a guide on how trainer AI works to figure out which one of these moves they would use and then find the odds of that move missing or not getting a secondary effect. So that's all taken care of. But if we scroll down this final odds column, you'll notice some zeros sprinkled in here and there. That means that you have no move that can one-shot this Pokemon regardless of whether or not you crit. In these cases, I had to use Pokemon Showdown's damage calculator to simulate several turns of a battle, finding the most optimal way to KO that Pokemon with the help of crits and stuff when needed. I also had to keep track of certain secondary effects like moves that can flinch or apply status conditions because we can't have any of those and then manually recorded those odds in one final column. For the most part, the strategy for a run like this is pretty similar to a regular speedrun with a few main differences. The first battle of the speedrun against your rival typically takes four to five hits depending on how much he decides to growl. But if you get two crits and a halfway decent roll on one of them, then you can get it done in two. As I mentioned before, a regular speedrun will generally KO a few wild Pokemon on Route 1 to get an extra level or two, which makes the battles in Viridian Forest more reliable. Unless, of course, you can score three crits on Bugcatcher Sammy's Weedle, in which case, you don't need it. From there, everything remains about the same, with the exception of catching the Nidoran that we talked about before, until you reach this kid, Youngster Josh. A speedrun will generally opt to fight this kid, even though you can technically skip him. The extra experience from this battle, combined with the rare candy that you can pick up, will get you to level 19 before you fight Misty, so that you can learn Bite, which can reliably two-shot her starving. However, they also make a quick pit stop to talk to this guy to learn Mega Kick a very strong normal type move that only has 75% accuracy. The speedrun doesn't rely on it too much because they can easily miss, but if you're lucky, landing two crit mega kicks is enough to KO Starmie in the same amount of time, allowing you to completely skip the rare candy and Youngster Josh. Nerd! From here on out, you'll be a bit lower level than you would be in a typical speedrun, but if you're lucky enough to get crits whenever you need them, you can more than make up for the deficit. There is one last bit of RNG that we haven't talked about yet when you get to Vermilion, and that's Lieutenant Surge's gym, aka the coolest, most fun, not infuriating, no-skill puzzle in the whole game. In this gym, there are 
15 trash cans. One random can will have a switch at the bottom of it, and then one of the cans next to it will have a second switch. The luckiest option would be for the first switch to spawn in the can right in front of you, which is a 1 in 15 chance. And then you have three more options for the second switch next to it, so you have a 1 in 3 chance of guessing right the first time. Multiply them together and you find that you have a 1 in 45 chance of solving the puzzle in one go. Wow, look at me having so much fun! There's nothing else super interesting for a long while. You completely steamroll the middle portion of the run, including clutching out a win against Giovanni in Celadon with an underleveled War Turtle. There is one complicating factor that we have to be aware of when battling trainers like gym leaders, and that's potions. If you're not able to KO a Pokemon in one shot and instead get them really, really low with the crit, then on their next turn, they'll just heal that Pokemon back up, putting you back to square one. In cases like this, it's better to get a regular hit on the first attack and then a crit on the second one to completely bypass their healing range. This doesn't really come into play until later battles in the Pokemon League, but it's important to note these cases where the order of operations is important. The real big change between this run and a speed run comes at the very end, against the final rival battle and the Elite Four. Normally, what you do is make a pit stop in the Celadon City department store and buy a bunch of X items. Then, at the start of each Elite Four battle, you take a few turns to juice up your Blastoise and then smash through their whole team. The problem is, walking into the department store and buying all these items takes some time, nearly 50 seconds. And now, I'm not suggesting that you do this or saying that it's a good strategy, but technically speaking, if you get lucky enough, you don't need them. These X items make these difficult late game battles a lot more consistent and reliable, but in Bizarro World where you always crit when you need it, they don't actually save you any time. As an example, in the battle against Lorelei, you need to use two X specials to guarantee that you can win the battle in 11 turns. If you don't use these X specials and are relying on luck to get crits when you need them, then you can complete the battle in 11 turns. This same thing is true for every single battle in the league with two exceptions. Using X specials will save you one turn in the final rival battle before Victory Road and two turns against Agatha. Not using X speeds will also mean you can't outspeed eight Pokemon, meaning they'll get a free turn on you. Granted, if you're lucky, this free turn won't accomplish anything, but it's still time wasted. All told, this will add on an extra 17 seconds to your Elite Four run, but remember, we cut out 50 seconds from the trip to the mall, so all told, you can save a total of 33 seconds if you simply bank on having absolutely insane luck. Which honestly really doesn't sound that great when you spell it out. You still need some PP restoring items like ethers and elixirs for the Elite Four run that I made sure to factor in with the shortest routes through caves because there are a couple of cases where we'll be relying on Blizzard and Mega Kick, which we were able to hold on to because we had Nidoran for strength instead of having to put it on Blastoise. Both moves only have 5 PP and Mega Kick specifically we need to use 7 times. But, if everything goes exactly your way, if you never missed an attack, if you got every critical hit that mattered, if you dodged every attack that you possibly could, and only got the encounters that you absolutely needed, then congratulations! You've just beaten Pokemon Fire Red in what I could only imagine is record-breaking time. If not, I mean, that's on you at this point, man. There's only so much I can do. But after all of that, 
in what I can only imagine was a way too long video, we have come to the final solution. We have calculated the odds for every single instance of RNG in the whole game. Now, the final step is to find the odds of all of those things happening sequentially. To do that, we need to multiply each individual probability together. Everyone who clicked on the timestamp in the comments saying, answer is here, welcome back. <laughs> hey, it's me, Future Charlie again. Remember that one extra tile that I accidentally added in way back when? Yeah, that ever so slightly changed the final results, so now I gotta come back and redo this part too. <laughs> so, doing all the math, it turns out that the odds of getting perfect RNG in a Pokemon Fire Red speedrun, assuming you don't get a shiny Pokemon, is 1 in 4.83 times 10 to the 202. An absolutely insane number that defies comparison, and yet, that's only scratching the surface. Because the odds of getting perfect RNG and getting a shiny Squirtle, Nidoran, and Pidgey or Spiro is a staggering 1 in 2.66 times 10 to the 214. That's 1 in 26.6 septuagintillion. Yep, that is a real number that I did not make up. Now, I'm gonna hazard a guess, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm guessing that most of you aren't regularly working with numbers in the Septuagintillions. So, allow me to put that into perspective for you. There are an estimated 10 to the 82 atoms in the universe. The odds of getting this lucky in Pokemon Fire Red is the same as choosing one lucky atom out of two Traquadratantillion universes. A unit that I'm sure we're all far more f Oh, oh no? You don't use Traquadratantillions either? Hmm, okay, okay, how about this? How about this one? The smallest unit of time possible is the Planck time, which is equal to 10 to the negative 43 seconds. Try and divide time into smaller units than this, and you start violating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and believe me, you don't want to do that. I have no idea what this is. So, say you have an incredibly fast quantum computer that can simulate an entire speedrun of Pokemon Fire Red every single Planck time. It would likely take this computer 84 Traquinquagentillion years to get this perfect RNG run, which, as we all know, is approximately the time it would take for 7.3 untrigentillion black holes of one solar mass to fully decay due to Hawking radiation, or, of course, 8.4 noventrigentillion times longer than it would take for every nucleon in the known universe to decay. So hopefully that clears some stuff up. Truthfully, the odds of getting a run this lucky are so infinitesimally small that we will, I'll say it, certainly never see it actually achieved. Unless, of course, you're a sick hacker, in which case, I mean, it'd probably be pretty easy. But if you do manage to beat these odds clean, these insanely small odds, then you, my friend, have made history. And you should probably make peace with the fact that nobody will ever believe you. Now, if you'll excuse me, this video took way longer to make than I thought, so I'm gonna go nap forever. Right, right, nap start. This video was made possible by all my patrons, including Alakazam, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Ausarung Freud and Selicet. Without you, videos like this would literally not be possible. So truthfully, thank you.